feminism started in the home with my mother, a working class woman, a factory worker from the Cape Flats, who wanted her daughters to achieve so much more. And so my mother never allowed us to do any ho housework and we had to focus on our schoolwork. from a generation of um, women that you know didn't go to school that didn't have the opportunities my great-grandmother was a farm worker my grandmother was a cook my mother was a factory worker and suddenly they have a daughter with a master's degree that has traveled the world I was born under apartheid at the age of 19 um, it was no more I voted for the first time I immediately became a reporter at um, the public broadcaster if it was two years or three years prior to that, that wouldn't have happened. Um, and so things have changed in my lifetime and for that I'm, I'm very grateful. For me, you know, entering the newsroom in 95, um, you know, it was a very, it was a very depressing time um, at, at moments, you know, because simply you just didn't know if um, to negotiate spaces, you know, going just up to your editor and saying, well, but I do think, you know, I should be given a chance to cover politics and not just my male counterpart. You know, when you don't quite know how, to, you're, you're young, you're 21 years old, you quite don't know how to deal with those dynamics. Every year in South Africa we have 16 days of activism, which has become a month. So this is the big space where all organizations have um, marches, violence against women marches, um, you know, you just have a myriad of activities. Those women that have stayed, you know, they've had to work really hard and they've had to put gender off the agenda. So that's the other how, you know, some women have had to deal with it. Let's not talk about gender. I'm equal. I'm not going to do a, a woman's story just because I'm a woman. I mean, what's interesting for me in terms of the, f the female editors that we now see, because people will say, but the major newspapers have women editors, so what's the problem? I don't think they've necessarily had a radical um, feminist or gender agenda. You know, quite frankly, they could, you know, they, for them, it's a, you know, it's a business. They need to be editors, and it just so happens to be that they women, and that's why they got the jobs. But the fact is, they got the jobs because they are women, and because their newspaper owners realized that they needed to shift dynamics. And you know what? Actually, it would make business sense if they should just actually look a bit closer in re-looking at content, re-looking at the staffing, because women are the majority in our society, you know, in terms of access to employment, in terms of access to opportunities, more and more women are coming to the fore. And here is a market that if you can actually write and talk to these um, women, these, um, you know, our new sort of working um, group of young women, you know, there's a market, there's money to be made. So it actually would make business sense. But, um, you know, right now that's not what they're looking at. We were involved with the Beijing Platform of Action because as Women's Media Watch we were part of a global group of um, women's organization that monitored how the media was reporting on the Beijing process and there was quite a lot of um, excitement and activity around it. There were, I mean, I didn't go to New York myself, but I know a lot of women who did, you know, and it was really a moment for South Africa to shine. And shine, you know, some South African activists did. You know, 20 years later, I do think it's a very different, um, different story. Um, of course, we still have a lot of African feminists and African women's organizations um, that have been actively involved. And I mean, we saw um, in 2014 in Addis Ababa, you know, the African organizations met and there was a big civil society to discuss the Beijing Plus 20 process. And of course, you know, some of the work that came out of it is speaks to the changing face of Africa and, you know, how globally things have changed and what still needs to be done. I do think in the South African case, I mean, it's been rather disappointing um, in terms of firstly coverage, in terms of the issues. It's really been shifted to the margins again and it's off the agenda. Um, I really don't think, I mean, if, if there was one or two stories um, of the process, you know, that was a lot. 
Beijing is just far away, but actually if you break it down, Beijing can matter and Beijing matters. How do we just simplify it to ensure that ordinary women understand the power that they have and that they can um, make and bring about change within not their communities, but I also think in the broader uh, media, um, media environment. You know, women always pointed out that they never saw themselves. You know, it was always negotiated through someone with um, straight hair or a weave or a wig um, or a light, light of complexion person. Instead of seeing someone with their natural hair, um, dark skin color, fat, um, you know, it was always negotiated through different prisms of how a woman should, should look. Um, and for me, you know, it's going back to those very basic steps, starting media activism at schools, whether it's media clubs, within the NGO sector, um, starting um, an engagement around, you know, representations of women in the media. I can proclaim that, yes, I will give both sides and I'll try the best to tell a story in its most objective manner, but I've, I come with my own personal political baggage that I'm not going to just, you know, dump on the sideways. It's taken me a long time to get here and I'm going to want to put in a women's voice, I want to put in a gender perspective because it is important. Because I've seen change in my lifetime, I know that it is possible and that you have to be an optimist. Um, you can't just um, forget about these things.